Hey, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod episode 43. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. End of the week here. Uh, big news week this week. Obviously, a huge mega deal with HPE and Juniper. We had great team coverage. Dave, great to see you. Also, great, great, great action this week. CES happened. A lot to review there. Also, in the tech world, uh, AI continues to boom along and just so much action happening. So, great to see you. Yeah, hey John, how you doing? Nice job this week putting together the uh, what'd you call it, the emergency cube. That was fun. <laughs> Had Melanie on and Jake and Zeus. It was awesome. Shelly did a did a hit on that. So yeah, big news. It wasn't really an emergency pod. It was an emergency cube because we had to bring in the analysis. And I appreciate the uh, quick uh, quick data you pulled together through the cube research. Phenomenal work. And again, really impressed with the response from the community on the cube research uh, initiative. Um, super excited to continue to build that out this year. Again, we're just continuing to, to keep the content going. Our mission this year doesn't really change from our North Star from 13 years ago. Continue to get the content out. This podcast will be our time to riff, Dave. So um, I always love loved this. And I think this year we'll start adding guests in there, bring in some guests in for a whole hour. We can spare some minutes to bring in you know, the Andy Jassies of the world. So um, we had we'll some guests last year. We had uh, John Chambers, right, last year came on, but yeah. it wasn't really a main focus. People like this. So we'll, again, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep testing it, keep pushing it out there. We got to work on the promotion uh, of the pod. But you know, if you're listening, uh, take a minute to to like it, share it, and put it out there, and give us feedback. So always great. So Dave, this week a, a bunch of talk about things. Talk about. So first of all, um, HPE Juniper. We'll get to that. Man, the layoffs just massive this year. Um, again, you know, we said on the pod. I can't remember which pod it was, early pods, but the planes would be falling out of the sky. Absolutely, that's what the case is. Um, huge amount of layoffs. Dude, the market's hemorrhaging at many levels. If you're not on the right side of history here, we're we're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna be gonna be roadkill. So we're gonna get into the big segment on, on that around what startups do have a path, which ones don't. Exciting news from the from the uh, SEC. Finally, the approves the bitwise. A deal. They're actually ringing the bell. I was just talking to the New York Stock Exchange just earlier this morning around you know the fact that you have ETF trading on Bitcoin. Um, that should change it, but Bitcoin's down two thousand points. So, well, do you um, see Ether, e Ethereum's closing the gap. Bitcoin's been outpacing Ethereum all year. Ethereum's catching up now. So it's really kind of interesting dynamic. It's like sell the news, and then Ethereum's been rocketing. I have an opinion on the whole crypto thing. I think it's it's, it's going to mirror the dot com bubble. The, you, once the shit gets out of the bubble burst and all the carnage is done, it gets back to normalcy. I think crypto, I'm long on crypto, obviously, and blockchain, you know that. We both are now that that's out of the system. Um, the OpenAI de debuted their GPE store, GPT store for paid users. That's hap happening. You're starting to see people starting to put their stuff out there. Notice a little slow response piece, right? So you know, already 3 million plus chatbots so far. Everyone's taking their content and rolling it in. There's also trivia coming on the net network now from Charles Fitzgerald pointing out that some of the large language frontier, fr frontier models, he's calling them, or original models, proprietary models, the large models, are actually outperforming the small ones with good prompts. So I will get into that one. Twitch just laying off over 500 jobs. That's a sign. Amazon Studios cutting back. Um, just a ton of action um, going on. If CES was just all things AI. You know, you start to see AI bring back those stuck industries, the smart home, automotive, smart manufacturing. These areas have been stalled, Dave. AI is bringing that back. So big, big discussion there. Um, AI is talking to um, companies on media to index their stuff. Just so much happening in, in the world there. And obviously, you know, Google's laying off people. Uh, Discord laying off people. Just I got to give you some stats on that, John. So I'm looking at the latest ETR survey. I, I, I can't tell you too much because they haven't released all the data yet, but they have this drill down and they're asking people, okay, you know, what's your budget going to do? Increase, decrease. For those that said they're going to decrease budget, they said, what's your number one or what are the methods that you're going to use to decrease the budget? Number one now is reducing staff. Okay. That's 23% of the subsector that said they were cutting. But this is what's really interesting. When you look at the industry verticals and you do IT, it goes up, it jumps up from 23% to 35% of those respondents said that's how they're going to, you know, meet their targets. They're going to reduce staff. And then the other thing is the uh, the layoffs are, are definitely 
higher, somewhat higher in North America than they are in like yeah. EMEA and, and very high in APAC. Um, so, but, 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 but it stands out. And so in, in IT, so. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, there's a bunch of stories out there that have similar thread lines to them. One is um, uh, meta. There's a story out there talking about how AI replaced the metaverse. We talked about this on the, on the pod before. Remember how met, meta metaverse. Um, that was my since, prediction last year is that AI, uh, AI, you know, generative AI wins where metaverse failed. Well, there's a huge story out of Bloomberg with sourcing sources that's saying how describing how AI placed replaced the metaverse with Zuckerberg's top as top priority, leading to massive ruthful, ruthlessly cutting jobs and then pivoting quickly for AI products. We saw what Meta did with the open source donation. That was a huge coup, I, as I pointed out on the pod before. Uh, and then another weird story came up on Charles Fitzgerald. Fitzy's um, point is, open AI inflection and cohere held back channel talks on AI policy and safety with Chinese state-backed groups in Geneva in July this past summer. So- so China. I want to comment on I want to comment on on the the meta thing. I mean, they, it's like a a Nadella moment, like when Microsoft went all in on the cloud. Remember, they were sort of you know missing cloud. They were trying to put you know uh, Windows on phones and said Nadella came in. But so I think that's what what Zuckerberg's doing. He's like, hey guys, you know, let's just pivot. You go hard after Gen AI, and and they seem to be getting a lot of traction. They're showing up again in the surveys. Uh, Llama is is outpacing um, some of the other proprietary models like Anthropic uh, by a little bit. Miss Charles getting traction. Are they in the survey too? No, they didn't show up. Cohere and Anthropic show up. Uh, but um, um, And then, of course, OpenAI is like seven times bigger than anybody else in LLMs. Uh, uh, Llama is maybe 20% above Anthropic, which is yeah. kind of interesting. And, you know, this is just random surveys of IT pros, 1700 yeah. N. Open so AI. It's a good is, number. So open AI is still dominating then. Oh, dominating. I mean, they are so still who, who up said, and to the Who right. said that first mover advantage would be a key for them? Who no, said? I said, yeah, yeah, you did. You did. We had a breaking analysis. Sarbjeet <laughs> and I were like trying to be contrarian, saying they're not going to be able to leverage their first mover advantage. Jury's still out, but. It yeah. looks like looks yeah. like you were right and I was wrong on that call. <laughs> well, still yeah. early to tell, but again, <laughs> it's just again, this is the innovation <laughs> dilemma, right? So, uh, and uh, you know, in other other news, we're seeing uh, you know VMware being assumed by Broadcom. There's a lot of channel press going out there around some of the changes that VMware and Broadcom are going through. It looks like, as you had predicted, Dave, I didn't really disagree with it, but you were really almost nailed it per. Per move, every play in the book you've nailed um, with Broadcom and VMware that they were going to pull the uh, the gutting, and they're actually doing it exactly as as we had predicted, um, and uh, simplifying the the, the products. Uh, VMware has gone to just simple swim lanes. No more vSphere. You get VCF, VMware Cloud Foundation, which includes vSphere and everything. You get all the products, and the price just went up. Can't and, buy vSphere by itself anymore, the fifteen hundred or whatever. And, you gotta and, buy everything. And VCF does very well in the market. It's got a lot of momentum. So I think that's really smart by by VMware to really double down on that, package it up, say, here it is. You know, use the tools. You're paying for them, use them. Um, if prices are gonna go up, that's gonna inten in in intensify people's desire to use them. You don't really have a lot of choices as a VMware customer. You know, where are you really gonna go? You're gonna go to 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 Nutanix, you know, you're going to go to OpenStack. I mean, yeah, you know, maybe if you're a telco, but you really don't have a lot of choices. You know, you're going to go to Microsoft, I guess, maybe, but you're not going to get off that stuff easily. So it's, it's interesting. One of the things that came out of the HPE Juniper Networks, HP buying Juniper for 14 billion in our breaking analysis on our video, um, quick hit there was the consolidation play of Broadcom is becoming kind of a standard right in how they do it with certain companies so you know your point about how broadcom's going to operationalize the core vmware and keep some stuff around uh, as upside potential as again it's just an extra bit that's going to always cut is interesting right so the you know they're very sticky broadcom with vmware so i think they have a lot of leverage as fitzgerald pointed out on his blog platforming engineering um they're going to chop down the 6,000 or 600 customers that can't move and just jack the prices up on them. So meanwhile, 
the other areas are all hedges, Tanzu, security, and they have a telco business, which is just simply just VCF for telco, which is like just same thing, but just for telcos. Well, I, I had said, I thought, I thought carbon black was ripe for delevering. I, I still feel that way. You know, Tanzu is interesting. I, I mean, I think that is maybe one that I got an issue. I mean, we'll see yeah. whether or not that, because it's a whole cross cloud thing. Um, yeah. and in the whole cloud strategy that Gelsinger initiated after yeah. several failed attempts, uh, being it's going to be interesting to see what they do with cloud. Will they, will they bunker in on, on prem? Okay. I have, hybrid? I, I have a prediction. I have a prediction and on some sources, again, I haven't confirmed this, but I'll just say it because it's that rumor at this point. And it's my, and it's my prediction intuition. Broadcom is selling, they sold carbon, they spun out carbon black, they got rid of that end user computing. But I wouldn't be surprised if they drop the VMware cloud on AWS. Because what does that help? They're going, if they're going all in on the data center, because that's what Hoctan's doing. Okay, Hoctan and team are all in on the enterprise. Data center, edge, cloud operations, maybe Tanzu fits in there. Maybe that hangs around. But I would, they, they, might, they might cut VMware cloud on AWS. What does that give? What does that give them, call. Dave? What does that give them? So, it gives them license license fees, but it, it also gives, it gives it, Amazon it, it, their customers. But but yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, I remember when they first announced that, um, we were down, we were at AWS Public Sector, twenty sixteen. Yeah, and we were talking to customers, and the customers like, yeah, this is kind of a one way street to the cloud. Now, you know, there's talk about repatriation and I'm not, I'm not a repatriate, but I could see Hawk Tan saying, why are we giving him this fast lane to the cloud? Let's just keep them where they are. So, exactly. but remember, remember AWS created a bare metal instance to support VMware cloud on AWS. VMware has also done similar deals with uh, other cloud providers like Microsoft, like I think Google as well. They run on all clouds. Yeah. But 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 so it gets them license fees and it does get them super cloud. But hold on, hold on. I have an opinion on. I have an opinion on this. Here, here's the take. Here's my take. So first of all, if you're Hawk Tan, right, and you're looking at what Charles Fitzgerald is pointing out in his post about how they're going to jack the prices up, he says when private equity, because he says it's a private equity, when when this, when private equity comes starts almagating, start migrating. That's his kind of famous line. And so if you're a VMware customer, you might say. I'm out of here, but they can't really switch. So if Hoctan knows that's the case, and that's his whole strategy to up the prices, why would you want to give them an option to go to AWS? Now, if you can host vSphere on AWS all you want, but why would you want to use VMware on AWS? If you're Hoctan, you kill that, because that's basically a backdoor out of exit strategy for migrating. So, um, and what's the revenue implications? Okay, just cut it out. There's no, no one's going to buy it. We just cut it. I mean, well, I mean, if you if like. your if your business model is Hotel California, that you you don't want to have give them a back door to leave. I mean, that's right. well. So. I I I will go on, go on record saying that I would not be surprised if a VMware or Hoctan and Broadcom just say cut uh, AWS uh, and VMware on AWS cloud. That doesn't mean they can't have v vSphere and stuff in the cloud as cloud operations. But if you're a data center, he's going all in on the data center. I mean, that's their whole bread and butter and so, they don't want people switching. And what, what so are people going to do? You know, if, if I'm a CIO, say, I don't want to buy any more VMware. They're going to hold the line for a couple of years until they get fired or quit. And then the new guy is going to come and say, wait a minute, how come we're not expanding? Uh, so the new guy so didn't what does that, spend license on this. What, do, what does that mean to kill it? Are they just going to stop selling it? Or they just, can't, just shut down? Stop. You, just, you can't just, stop supporting it. I mean, they've sold it, right? They're going to well, just say, sun, pull no the more, plug? Pull the plug, lay off the people and just shut down that, wind it down. Because wow. it's VMware on AWS, you can still run vSphere on the cloud in context to the VCF on premise. That's my point. I mean, I think Gelsinger did it to streamline. Remember, remember our take on that was at that time in 2016, VMware had no cloud strategy. Remember, right? So they were what all you're over saying the place. is they consolidated it under one banner, made it look good, and Amazon's been poaching customers ever since. We've been reporting that on the Cube and SiliconANGLE for four years. Okay, but but what you're saying is then the the scenario would be you'd be running VMware from your your on-prem VMware console as opposed to doing it from you know natively on AWS. Correct. Yeah, you don't you don't need which, AWS. Which, which by the way, 
by the way, to me, that makes more sense anyway, because I can run, I can, I can manage my cross cloud estate. Now that's where super cloud makes sense. I run that from my VMware console on prem, you know, or wherever my colo yeah. and I'm running across clouds, which I'm not going to run across clouds. I'm, I'm probably not going to manage that cross cloud capability from Amazon. So that okay, yeah. so in that you, scenario, you, you run cross plug, you, you run cross cloud from a VMware origination. You're using VMware operations. You can run vSphere and vSAN in the cloud all you want, and then but you're running it on under that 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 umbrella. You're not just yeah. Have... That so that makes sense. You're, that now your prediction makes makes a lot. Actually, I think you're dead on. I think that <laughs> I I would do the same if I were Hawk Tan. That you know. <laughs> we'll get get we'll get him on the cube. It's going to be a matter of time before he realizes that you know we we're the best out there in terms of getting the analysis done. Um, so we'll get Hawk Tan on the cube very shortly, uh, as well as the other execs. Because what's going to happen is is that Broadcom is going to integrate from the chip to the app. It's, it's so clear to me that the chip game is about what the stack looks like in a converged world of distributed computing. Meaning, you got to have chip advantage. It's so sticky. Broadcom moves so fast. I, I I love their business model, even though they they come from a chip DNA, semiconductor DNA. Because if you look at the competition Broadcom's had with other people in chips, they just out innovate everybody. They move faster and they actually build good shit. Their stuff's good. And what happens is they get leverage there and they create stickiness. By the time the competitors match the price. And, and speed of their chips, Broadcom's already changed the game and moved the goalposts with better product and more integrated stuff. So, you know, in, uh, what came out of HPC for me, I'm talking to Chaz Tremblay, uh, uh, who runs some of their data center business, was it's clear to me what they're doing with the chips is what's around the chips. That's the key. So you've got a CPU, GPU, whatever, what's around it. And with the Ethernet stuff that they're doing, you know, Ethernet going, you know, gigs and gigs and gigs faster, hundreds of gigs, you're going to have connectivity. And again, we saw with HPE and Juniper, the network action is going to be where the, that last battle for cloud supremacy and AI supremacy will be because the latency, everything's about the network. How fast can packets move? How fast is the data moving? Networks will be the holy grail, just do like you, the old Do you days. remember, I'm sure you remember this, you and I went down to Armonk to meet with uh, Bob Picciano. Bob Picciano, for those who don't know, he was... He's like a legend inside of IBM. You know, he he high, very high quality executive, super technical, and he was running their data and analytics business. And they kind of Ginny kind of jettisoned him to, you know, make him run the power power business. Remember that? And we went down there, mm -hmm. and he was mm -hmm. doing the whiteboard. This was really early last decade, and he was like, "Look, guys, here's what's happening." Because he was he knows silicon. You know, IBM roots. He's a long time IBMer, super technical guy, great great executive he was drawing on the whiteboard you remember john all the alternative processors that were were happening mm -hmm. now of course they had an agenda against x86 but he's like look the npus the the cpu the npu the 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 gpus all these alternatives are emerging and that's going to create a lot of contention of inside the processor complex inside the system to move data around and and that's where to your point about Broadcom's bet, they bet, this is early, last decade, Broadcom bet on th that connectivity across all those alternative components. So that network-centric architecture inside the system. And that has just become a huge source of value. And they're just, you know, yeah. creating a, a, a lot of revenue from that and a lot of value for, for customers that's sort of hidden under the covers. Yeah, you know, Bob Picciano, Northeastern grad, first class of the computer science um, uh, college. Uh, he and I still debate that whether that was my year. <laughs> right, because he he was a year earlier than you, yeah. right? And he, and he says he says it was, he was the eighty two was the first year. No, eighty seven. Eighty no eighty two entry, eighty seven uh, exit. I right, was five years. Right, I but so eighty two was he said that's when they started the computer science program and you were like well that really wasn't the real computer sci science program it started in 83 your yeah. your freshman year <laughs> <laughs> so well my my debate was that northeastern started the college of computer science in 1983 my freshman year he might have been in the college of engineering that had the computer science program but in terms of establishing the college that's where we get in that pissing match anyway we've had that argument uh, that fun argument for a decade. What a great guy. I miss Bob Picciano. We should reach out to him and find out where he's at. I know he's sitting on some boards. He did a lot of great work at IBM and he was pushed to the side. 
Uh, he had the whole insights early uh, with data. Um, you know, him and Rob Thomas were, were two great executives. Rob Thomas is still there. Um, good, and good, good. We should do, we should ping at IBM and find what they're up to. Um, anyway, so Dave, just quick, quick, another head, head nine note here, just while I got it here. Um, Bitwise, which is one of the uh, ETF, uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs on first day of trading, has early data coming in. They saw 238 million of inflows into its spot Bitcoin ETF on the first day of trading. So okay, this was, now this now, you got, now, news, you got, right? now you got BlackRock and Fidelity coming in too. So interesting, and Arc, right? And, Kathy Woods. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. You got a lot of people coming in. You got Valkyrie Spot Bitcoin, Grayscale Bitcoin. Um, those numbers have not come in, um, but you're looking at a total of almost a billion dollars if you combine some of these other flows. But Bitwise was more specific in releasing the numbers today. That was according to the block.com, block.co, which is uh, uh, the new site for uh, crypto. Uh, interesting. So, so I think the mainstream adoption is coming, Dave. This is I mean, I saw uh, a lot of us that were early on at Bitcoin doing a little celebration today because this is a mainstream aspect of it. Yes, I mean, it's 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 po it popped obviously big time. And well, you, of course, first the, the, you remember uh, the there was a hack. And the SEC's uh, Twitter profile got hacked, and somebody put out, "Hey, we approved uh, the the ETFs," and then the, the Bitcoin you know popped, and so somebody was gaming the system. And then Gensler came out and said, no, no, that was a hack. Uh, but then, uh, anyway, ultimately they approved it so that you can now trade uh, a Bitcoin. You can now buy a Bitcoin through an ETF. Now, so why would you do that? I guess you do that. You're not really owning Bitcoin. So when you when you buy Bitcoin through like a Coinbase or direct, you know, through other uh, markets, you own the Bitcoin. But with these ETFs, you're not owning the Bitcoin, right? They're tracking mm -hmm. essentially the Bitcoin. So why do you buy them? Why would anybody want to do this? Because the fees are lower. I mean, Coinbase is going to hit you for, I don't know, what, 1% fee? Now there's a fee war starting with all these ETFs. It's a beautiful thing. You know, they're charging you, I don't know, 0.1, 0 0.2. Um, and so it's a lot more efficient way to get into the market. But I, I know I, I, I'm excited about these other baskets that they might you know, create with, give me some Ave, give me some Solana, give me mm. some Cardona, the Sol yeah, yeah. you know? And so, uh, but yeah, I heard Kathy Wood on t TV the other day. I thought she was very articulate. They've been in, 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 in crypto for a long time. You and I have been, we've yeah. done so many crypto shows that were just awesome innovation, but, uh, I think, I think you can expect to see crypto become much more mainstream. A lot of people are on one side, um, celebrating this move because it's more legitimate, more trustworthy for retail. The, the hardcore decentralization folks are like, ah, oh, this is kind of like against the grain. We'll see. I think it's a positive sign. I think it's going to bring more liquidity uh, and into and, and regulation. The SEC gets a little comfort blanket here. Um, that, that's so. That's I think that's key. You know what else too is uh, Brian Armstrong uh, was talking about this the other day. You would think, you would think maybe he's against this, but not at all. I mean, he he was like very, you know, uh, complimentary of these ETFs. Of course, it obviously helps trading volumes and the like, but. Um, you know, he was, but be, he was basically saying, look, we still want some guidelines, you know, the sec saying that this is a security. Um, the other side says this is a commodity. I would just like to see the government be a little bit more, you know, a little less opaque about what they really want. They're just trying to say, all right, we're going to apply these old rules to the new crypto in a typical situation. Gensler, Seemingly, he has been trying to kill it now since his entire tenure. And then, and then his other interesting thing is the the all in guys, Shamat, who was early on in crypto, said on one of the all in podcasts, "Crypto's dead." And so, <laughs> I don't think crypto's dead at all. I think, to your point, crypto is like going to start building a base. Maybe it's dead from the standpoint of the pump and dump guys like Shamat, <laughs> who could get in and get out like he did with the SPACs. But just, I think uh, for the mainstream, crypto's not not dead at all. I'm just sending a note. Bob Picciano pinged me on LinkedIn. So he says, hello. I said, hey, we just talked about you. Your ear's ringing. I just pinged him on LinkedIn. Um, he's, a, he's at Rocket Software. Yeah. Um, he's, a, he's a board member at Solar Winds. I didn't realize yeah. that, helping them you know, yeah. kind of recover from that disaster maybe he could be uh, the C maybe he could be the ceo of our of our technology business maybe we'd love to have him bob if you're listening come by we'll 
we, you can you can run some tech over here. You're great. Amazing um, guy. Yep. The the, uh, the other thing I want to talk about, Dave, that happened last week was interesting. Is is that if you look at um, the Carta issue, I don't know if you follow what happened with the yeah. of Carta. Carta, yes. a loan sales rep, went out and basically poached the cap table information, um, used the cap table information of a startup to sell a secondary buyout to one of the angel investors without the founder's knowledge. So the founder went ballistic, took it to Twitter and called him out. And then the CEO, I mean, it was kind of founder on founder and the guard of CEO was kind of cocky, but he then kind of said, hey, you know, why call this out publicly? Send me an email. So obviously the guy had an ax to grind and um, the CEO's response was like a PR nightmare. And then it went just sideways from there. And what happened was, was a, quite the scandal. Um, and then the car to end up reversing its policy and said, oh, this rogue salesperson. And then the CEO said, we're getting out of this business and just shut it down. So, the rumor so explain had it this. That, so explain it, that a little bit, because Carta had a business, the one they shut down, which was to get private companies liquid. Now, these are the guys that run probably 50 percent or more of the private companies cap tables. So they have a service. Let's explain this. They have, Carta has a service that allows companies to use their onboard SaaS software to handle all the administrative work around a, a company's equity ledger. So who holds what stock and cap capitalization tables or cap tables, as they call it. Cap table is the how a company is capitalized. You know, the founders own equity, maybe a percentage. There's a stock pool, venture capitalists own and, and external investors own a percentage. And then you have details around when they bought the stock, how they bought the stock, when it's going to vest, when it's going to be due, how much it's worth, the strike price, all the 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 grunt labor that's involved in tracking this and stuff. it's a I mean, dashboard you go in yeah. and it, it, when there's a capital call it tells you how much is due and yeah. how much you owe and how much you've committed and it's just a it's a great service it's a great but, it's a great service because but, it solves a lot of problems yeah. but they have all the information and remember the old facebook adage you're the if you're you, if you don't know who the product is you're the product so the the joke about facebook was the users were the product not the application itself in other words facebook used the data of the users to do targeting and make money but they also had a service but they also had a service to get uh holders of of private shares liquid so right? carter, they would, they carter created fig markets carter figured out that they could make more money selling separate division that sold got employee stock liquids and they had it. So it was just another transaction vehicle for them. And so what ended up happening is you had rogue behavior of a sales rep who snuck into the system to look at the cap table and start matching buyers and sellers without the founder's notice or board. That is just freaking wrong, right? Like that's So you have a clear <laughs> conflict of interest, right? That's, that's, yeah. Right? So. I, first of all, good business model. I think I would keep the, I wouldn't have shut down the secondary. I wouldn't have given it to the mob. If I was the CEO of Card, I would not have given it. I would have said, hey, we're really sorry. We are going to spin this out as a separate division, separate building, separate systems. But it's a lucrative business model for us. And we want your trust because it's a trust business, right? It's really I think he made the right move, John. I think uh, that was the right PR move, shutting it down. I, mean, I, don't, know was, about, I don't know about It's that. too much of a conflict of interest. Um, well, maybe they weren't making any money, but I, I'm I don't sure think that was that lucrative for them. I think it was maybe a few million bucks of their business. Yeah. Why, why risk the whole, well, their whole core product job. is trust. Their core product is trust. And, you know, if you're a company, you don't want to have your cap table information being held by someone that's going to be as evil as Facebook relative to the position. So, um, good call to shut it down. I guess I would agree with you. Earn the trust back and bunker in. So that was, that was one I thought. Um, big opportunity there. Um, the other one was um, just their influence. So that, that was there. Now, the other thing is everyone jumped on the bandwagon. Angel list came out. And so the, the, the question is the other founder, the motivation for him to go public, I'm suspect because he's the next Y Combinator guy and his friends have businesses is, and, and the stockholder involved was his relative. So it wasn't like he was like affected, like in a blowback based from a shareholder. It was more of this was, I think this was the the system punching up to Carta saying, "Hey, because then all of a sudden came out of the woodwork, Angel is going to service is like five other companies come to us." So I guess that's how it works now, Dave. It's kind of a yeah. you know, it's a street brawl. I mean, we're in a we're in a market where this shit is happening. This is a street brawl. People are going to go after our business, your business, their business. Um, it's interesting. So it's going to be fun to watch how this this generation uh, of of leaders handles the 
fast moving AI wave that's coming. So I think I think there's going to be a very serious business climate. And and that that's on top of the layoffs. So my prediction is you're going to see um, a shift in mindset uh, uh, with the culture. Um, again, the revolution's happening and people are going to be fed up. I want to see serious business. You know, that line in, in, um, in the, um, uh, the, the movie, um, the show, um, 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 the HBO special where uh, he, the guy goes, you guys are not serious people. Succession. Remember that scene in succession? You, oh, yeah. are, you are not serious people. That's the message happening right now in Silicon Valley is that, you know, if you're not a serious business, you're out. Serious business means watch your cash. Don't run out of cash, drive value, get product market fit and, and get escape velocity. And so I think you're going to see a culture of more business model, less grandstanding, less of this hand waving, fake it till you make it. I mean, look at the companies, you know, there's a couple of companies I know out there that are hand waving their way around. They're faking it till they make it. They buy acquisitions, make themselves look good and then try to flip the company. This market is not going to tolerate that, Dave. If you don't have fundamental business model with revenue and a team with legit reference checks, not just hype and social media selfies, you can't sell your company. And so I think you're going to see an M&A market be very tight. Um, we, we, we saw some of that, you know, kind of pump and dump. We, obviously, you and I saw it when the dot-com boom. You remember how out of control that was. Um, there were very few, like, like really great businesses that came out of that. There were there were several, but in, ter in terms of the percentage of overall, and a lot of people made a lot of money just basically selling crap. Yeah, <laughs> and, the pump and dump. Yeah. Well, yeah. okay. Let we. I know we talked about the HPE Juniper deal um, at, at at length. And there's a mega post. I posted it on Substack, on LinkedIn. You post, wrote a blog post. You did a breaking analysis. Shelly posted. Shelly Kramer posted. We got videos. We got our, our ecosystem together. We got uh, our great Cube Collective coming together on news. You can see a lot more of this, folks, out there, by the way. You see the Cube bringing people together on camera super fast to do animal analysis. Um, but, you know, as you said, you, you're quoted here. I want to quote you here. You said, well, we don't see this move as a dramatic growth driver for HPE. The acquisition will improve the quality of HPE's earnings, bolster its free cash flow, and further strong support stronger momentum in the networking business, giving more ammunition to compete with the market leader, Cisco, and other networking pure plays. I actually shared that on Twitter, your soundbite around Dell versus HPE and having higher margins. Um, even though it's a consolidation play, you see this as clearly an opportunity for HP to solidify the base and drive value. I do. I mean, I think that, look, we, we have companies winning in with the consolidation play, like security is the best example. Palo Alto Networks, CrowdStrike, you know, even though, you, you know, the, the, the stock, if CrowdStrike's kicking ass. I mean, it's, they're doing really well with that story. Zscaler is winning. If this consolidation story plays. Why not have it play in, in networking? You know, Cisco, is in a good position to do that. So I think Antonio's smart. Aruba is their best business uh, from a profitability standpoint. They're winning in networking. They pick up Juniper. You know Juniper much better than I do, but it's a strong product portfolio, uh, good leadership. They got some AI chops with the missed acquisition. So I liked it. It was interesting to hear Steve Mullaney, who is a you know longtime operator in the networking business, CEO of Nicera. He was interim CEO of Palo Alto, CEO of Aviatrix, worked at Cisco. Uh, so very, very strong executive. He's saying, well, I would go, if I were running HPE, <laughs> I'd go for the growth play. I'd roll the dice. You know, <laughs> He's a gambler and he's a, he's a really awesome guy. Uh, I just feel like where, where HPE is and the board is and the mistakes they've made in the past, not so much HPE, but HP, with, that Meg Whitman had to come in and clean up that they're much better off trying to make the conservative yeah. play drive free cash flow. I, I think, you know, it's a test for Antonio, no doubt, but I think he's up for the test and I, I think it'll be a, a good move, not a radical move, not a huge transformation, but a, 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 a very strong stepping stone in improving their margin profile and the quality of their earnings and ultimately their valuation. Yeah, you know, not to not to toot our own horn, but I will. I think you and I are probably the most um, experienced analysts in the market when it comes to HP and HPE. We've got we've covered them for so long. I used to work there. 
um, in the 80s and 90s. We've been following every step of the way since the Cube and Silicon Angle has been covering. You've been covering them. Um, so I think, you know, we, we know a lot about their DNA and their people. Um, like I, I like I said on the on our on our um, panel and our uh, news coverage, they got a good culture. Um, you may people may throw throw water on their numbers. Maybe their growth is not where they need to be. Some even they're even though they're they're still in the billions. Antonio's got the HP culture. They got the compact HP culture, the best of both, uh, in my opinion. They're in Texas. They they didn't move the headquarters from Palo Alto, which sad for me personally, but they still have the other HP up there. So in Palo Alto, so you know the HP split is is kind of worked out. Um, I don't think it was the best move personally. I wouldn't have done it, but I think it worked out for everybody. And I like HP's prospects there. Not they don't get the fanfare they they get, but I like them. I like the people there. They're solid. We cover them every year, and we always get great content. And they're always on. They're always delivering value for customers. They might not be the fastest moving company, but they run a good business. Okay, well, they know they know their business. You you know I'll give you Antonio props. You remember the 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 gory days when Meg had to you know slog through. You used, used to say to me, Dave. She's taking one for the team for Silicon Valley, which is exactly what, <laughs> what she had to do. Um, and then, you know, people, well, after the after the Leo 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 debacle, debacle, you know. Oh my God, like, we're a CEO in their history. But so after they split the company, you know, there was a lot of dislocation, a lot of people griping, and ah, oh, it's a mess, it's a shit show, blah 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 blah. But when I went down to HPE, it was my first time at, at the new Houston headquarters last April. I got to tell you, the culture was, uh, and the enthusiasm was palpable. People were genuinely excited. When you look at their body language, they were proud to be HPEers, if that's even a, a term. Uh, they were excited to hear Antonio speak at the all hands meeting. It was fun. It was cool. It was it was energetic. I was I loved it. I was really impressed. It wasn't stodgy, what you'd expect out of a you know legacy tech company. It was people having fun, people dressed cool, great music, bands, you know, strong messaging, substance, and a lot of pride. Uh, I, so good for them. And I'd like, to, obviously, H, HP, HPE, great American yeah. brand. Yeah. And Juniper gets a good home and they have good shops there. Although Mist AI is the hot product. I'm going to do a special with Alan Cohen next week on the Cube. Um, he's coming in to do a deep dive on Mist AI and the AI ops around networking it's going to be very interesting now alan cohen he basically worked at um um airspace which was sold to cisco and when remember when i had my wireless days back in the early 2000s alan was in the same same class of that group as i was and so he and i both have like intimate networking chops of those early 802 uh, uh, wi-fi days then then and then uh big uh, wideland wlan uh, implementations he told me that a lot of the airspace guys were are moved over as part of that mist He's got a perspective. Also, next week on Wednesday, coming in next week on the Cube is the new and CEO that Intel spun spin out articulate. Arun's coming on. He was the Intel executives on SuperCloud Four with us. He now is the CEO of this AI spin out that Pat Gelsinger and, and Intel did. He's going to be on the Cube on Wednesday. We should have a great lineup with him, and that's going to be kick-ass. So a lot of good he Cube interviews. He was great, a lot, of, he, a lot of Cube interviews coming up, Dave. So he was awesome. I want to share with people. So what he said, we were talking about AGI at SuperCloud 4, I think it was, and I was asking him about you know AGI and what's his thought on AGI. And he said, you know, do you remember this? He said, let's do a thought exercise for a minute. Um, imagine just for a second, that AGI is already here. He said, wouldn't the AGI be smart enough to know that the humans would be scared? And wouldn't it fake us out, like do things like hallucinate <laughs> and lull us into a, a state of complacency before it took us over? And I was like, hmm, yeah, yeah. probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thought exercise. It was sort of um, a mind F. <laughs> well, in, in, speaking of AI, you know, let's go into some of the news here. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Microsoft briefly stole the top spot this week as the most valuable company over Apple for a brief minute. Um, Apple, as you know, is worth so much more. And Microsoft actually had a, a top of the spot. So, you know, as you pointed out on their momentum, Microsoft's well poised to continue the growth. Again, easy to work with, good channel. Their cloud's weaker than Amazon, but they're just, their enterprise go-to-market is just so exceptional. They do such a great job. And, you know, Amazon's got their hands full, AWS got their hands full to compete with that. Although they got the better product, but given some of the trends slowing down on growth, you know, this might come down to who's got the better army, Dave, 
and with customers. So Microsoft, Apple, same realm as most valuable company. Amazon, AWS, identity crisis. We'll see. We'll cover that like a like a blanket. Again, I hope to get Adam Sklesky and, and Jassy on, on the pod coming on this this quarter. So we'll stay tuned for that. And Vinny. I mean, I was just to say the remarkable thing about to me about uh, Amazon and Apple and this similar in the sense in the following sense that they're both very hardware centric obviously Amazon um does software but the software is made to run the hardware better um Apple you know similarly it's hard, hardware and software integration and 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 they've been able to win both companies but Microsoft it's software it's software economics they showed us in the 80s and 90s the power of the you know marginal economics at volume I've often joked, but not really joked. Even Bomber couldn't kill the company when they were largely irrelevant, going sideways for a decade. Um, you know, as I say, just or as I said earlier, trying to put, you know, do the Windows Phone. Everything was Windows, Windows, Windows. Um, and but their software estate was so large and so profitable and so good enough that they were able to just continue to throw off tons and tons and tons of cash to the point where they were able to transform and become the most valuable company in the planet for a, a, a quick moment. That's, it's an impressive, and in other news, you got NVIDIA's latest GPUs bringing AI to millions of laptops and PCs, generative AI, ask AI breaks down silos with customer raises 11 million. That's a good, good startup. Intel's targeting the automotive sector with AI generation, a enabled chips systems on chip for next generation cars, another $18 million funding for, Multilingual enterprise content generation, contents.com. And then Luma, uh, a developer of generating models that creates 3D, raised 43 million. Quora, remember Quora? They raised yep. 75 million led by A16Z for its Po AI chatbot creator program. So they're spinning out something. So Quora spinning out a new venture. Great data, Quora. And, and um, Amazon Cloud, they're cutting their fees on, on, on data transfer to zero. And just, you know, a lot of a lot of things happening. You know, PC shipments grow after two years of decline. Um, so you know, I saw some other analysts saying it's a PC revolution. No, no, it's evolution. The revolution already happened. <laughs> it's a PC revolution. Well, uh, you know, 43, you know, 42, 43 percent based on the survey data from ETR, 42, 43 percent of the employees continue to work at home. Yeah. You know, you thought that was most forecasts had that sort of reverting back to you know, 33 to 36%. It stayed up above that. Um, yeah. Of course, there's an article in the in, in my favorite paper, my favorite dead tree recently on uh, how the work from homers aren't getting the promotions, but uh, but maybe their side gigs are making up for it. I don't there know. was a viral video that went out around the Cloudflare employee who filmed her departure. That went super viral. It was so pathetic. It was bad. I mean, it was sad. But you know, some you know Gen Z. She recorded the whole thing. Literally had the camera on the Zoom speaker. Um, and you're right. She's a work at home, and she just started. And they were just turfing her, and they were claiming it was uh, you know performance related. She just started the job, and then hit like the, the holiday season, so she didn't make her number. Um, they clearly were turfing her because they're cutting back. But they used an excuse. But she recorded the whole thing. Dave, you're right. People who are working at home are getting cut. Okay, that's the unwritten kind of thing that's happening right out there, unspoken. It's a public secret. Everyone knows it. That's why the whole pushback to the office has got a lot of blowback because people are like realizing it. Yet some other guy go nuts on Amazon because Amazon's essentially firing people, uh, but not firing them, just basically, you know, reassigning them and kind of forcing a, I want to say quiet quitting, but like shifting jobs. And Okay, you got three months to find a job internally. Good luck. And then oh. no one's hiring remote remote. So this is going to be a blowback to the work at home thing. We're going to get, we should get Rebecca to work on a story on this because uh, I think it's a real problem. Um, I think work at home is fine for some people. You know how I feel about this. You know, there's a lot of virtual companies that are very, very successful. Um, some require in office presence. Some don't. Yeah, I agree. I think there's many, many examples of effective work from home. Um, but you know, I, I think if you're out of sight, out of mind, you might miss out on some of the interactions. Um, you certainly miss out on the chalk talk. People have been trying to force 
you know, uh, folks back. And I think actually, I think that works well. I know, for instance, Amazon, I think is what, three days a week, you got to be in the office. And I think that works pretty well. You can bookend the week. Um, I know Dell sort of changed its philosophy. If you're within, I don't know, I think it was uh, maybe 100 miles or 50 miles or whatever it is, you got to come into the office. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, if you're a coder, I think you can be very effective, you know, remotely. <laughs> but I think a lot of jobs, I think there's real benefit to being in the office. But I'm biased, John. I yeah. come in every day, even during COVID. I came in every day. I just, I like the collaboration. Others, I, love, I think are more effective. I, I, I love being in the office. I like to be on the road. But I mean, I like to be out and about, but I definitely love being in the office. I mean, if I'm, if I'm not in the office, I'm usually bunkering down on either some work, work hardcore work or, you know, meeting people um, for relationship cut sales or whatever, biz dev or employing recruiting and meeting, be getting data uh, for, for, for ports. Um, but yeah, I got to get there. Uh, by the way, I meant, I meant to mention this in the funding. Cloud-based network detection company ExtraHop raised 100 million in growth capital. They're they're Cube Cube alums, so good to see ExtraHop 100 million in this market, Dave. Growth capital, hats out to ExtraHop. Okay, so you know, I mean that's uh, that's you know Cube, you know, member uh, Jesse Rothstein. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's been on like he's been on four times, five times on the cube. One, two, three, four, four times going back to 2018. AWS reinvent, reinforce. Um we had Mark Bowling recently on at at uh, Falcon, you had him on at uh, CrowdStrike event. Um so extra hop doing good. Yeah, and market. I, 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 and he saw we and remember were you with me? No, I guess I was with Stu at uh, Doug Gourlay's little meetup in San Diego. Were you there? No, you weren't no, there. It was, it was a Cisco there. Live. And yeah. uh Jesse was there, you know, part of that crew. He's a cool dude. He's got the yeah. he's got the ponytail. He's got the <laughs> got the gray hair and the ponytail. He's a he's, he's like a, a hipster. He's a good hipster. Yeah. Uh yeah. elsewhere around the web, um, apparently there's big um thing with Substack. So one of their most prominent authors, Casey Newton, from who used to be with The Verge and now has a thing called Platformer, is leaving Substack, partly because of the the, how, the site wouldn't cut Nazi other right-wing nut jobs content. So there's another, on that's just what he's saying publicly, but he's leaving yeah. because he's, he said in his post, I've seen this movie before and I don't want to stick around to play with it. Saying that he's seeing other publications being promoted by the algorithm and he's afraid that if he stays there, they're going to use their algorithm to promote him. And he moved to Ghost. Ghost is what we use. It's an open source uh, blogging software we use for the cube.net we use wordpress matt mullingwig's uh, product uh for the silicon angle which by the way matt mullingwig just turned uh founder of automatic which does WordPress, just turned 40 years old i said to him happy birthday young and young one <laughs> yeah. yeah i met You're him still a 20. young man i met him when he was 20 wow um, 20 years we started wordpress a uh, great guy what a great journey um again distributed company so you start to see the trends, Dave. You know, you got you got um, Substack, which is trying to turn into a platform versus a publication. So very interesting dynamic around journalism going on. Um, you set the Founders Fund, general partner Keith Rabos joined, rejoined Coastal Adventures. He slingshot back there. So little Silicon Valley news there. And then just a lot of stuff. Oh, Marantis' co-founder, Alex Friedland, is returning to the company as the CEO. They've had a revolving door of CEOs. They were part of the the Docker divestiture. Remember, Docker sold them the enterprise Docker. Uh, we did a couple of events with them. Swarm, right? Don't they have? Don't they, aren't they no. Swarm or no? no Docker's no, they kept not. Swarm. Docker kept Swarm. No, they killed that. They killed they, it. Yeah, they killed it. So a lot of action going on again. Cloud meets data meets AI. Um, uh, Silicon Valley is under a lot of pressure. Again, in journalism, we're seeing a lot more companies going under. Again, we said that last week. We saw the 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 the, the destruction of media layoffs. Um, just a lot of challenges in this market. If you're a startup and you're in between rounds, you got to get customers, and you can't run out of money. So, you know, this is a tough moment for entrepreneurs right now who haven't had mar product market fit, and um, you know, I've been advising a few of them and. My advice is we can help, but the bottom line is you got to get customers. You got to find an exit ramp, either sell the team 
there's more there's more companies available now than ever before, Dave, to start. I mean, you can start a company. This is the best time to start a company. In every down market, what comes out of it is the, the people who who hit the streets, hit the lobby con, go meet, go to events, meet other entrepreneurs, and just reform another company. And I think but, that that's the key here is that if you got if you don't have a path to profitability, you should shut the thing down or merge it or get an exit. And and there's this narrative that you can, you know, you can start a company with a lot less now. And I get that, you know, same with the cloud, you don't have to buy Unix servers and, you know, EMC disk drives and, 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 and Oracle licenses. So that was true. And I know Jason Calcanis is big on, you know, Hey, you could do a company with four people now and get it to escape velocity. And he's not saying that I'm overstating that, but no, he's saying product you know, market fit, not escape velocity. I, I understand. Fit. But I, I guess what I'm saying is when you look at, like all the money that's being raised was raised over the last 10 years, most of it went to promotion, you know, go to market. Right. And, and a lot of that was wasted uh, because people would go try to get go to market fit before they even had product market fit. Mike, I guess my point is you're still going to need all those surrounding elements, the sales, the marketing, the partnerships, the channels, th those, I don't think those are going to go away. Now, you can maybe get to that point to you're saying product market fit with, with less money. So that's a good thing for, for VCs, I guess, because your denominator is going to be lower, the money you have to put in to get to a return. But I think at the end of the day, there's still these war chests that are going to happen. And these, these games are going to be played where a lot of money gets thrown at uh, these companies and the VCs push them to, to do unnatural things. And they hope that one of them, you know, breaks out. I don't think that's going to change. I don't either. I think I think I think what what will change is the speed of product market fit. You can you just like data centers and the cloud were a big dynamic in in um, getting a company up and running. You don't need to buy servers to get a company. Put your credit card down. Get get your demo out there. Get funding. That generation from 1998, roughly. Uh, I'm sorry, 2008, roughly to 2014. That window yeah. of startups, you saw the likes of Box.net. You saw the likes of Dropbox and Airbnb. Those were SaaS companies that were started by young kids in their 20s, 30s with ideas, and they just put their credit card. They didn't have to over-provision. So they, when they go and get their first round of funding, it was fast. They don't have to do a PowerPoint slide. They can say, look at our demo. We got users. Wow. And the VCs jumped all over that. That changed the game. That dynamic is happening now with AI, where AI is providing a similar acceleration to value for funding, meaning here's not only my product, I don't need as many people to work on it. You can do two two to three people could hack together uh, with AI and cloud and show a killer product. Then you get the funding, like say 300K or a million, and you're done. <laughs> you only have to hire four more people. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then escape velocity is a whole nother ball game. Cause then, then you say, okay, we're really hitting the big time. We're going to hit it with an inflection point. That's when you go for the big round. The VCs will all be like, here's 50 million. Here's a hundred million. Look at perplexity. They just yeah. raised a, a round and it could have been bigger. It was only, I mean, it was still a big round, but the valuation was only under 600 million. And so that tells me that the founders just probably said, Hey, you know, I don't want to be over the top here. Now, because exit values can matter in this. So, so again, psychology is still the same. I'm an entrepreneur. I see an opportunity. I want to go after it. How do I get, how fast can I capture the opportunity? Okay. That is the simple game. And, and people overcomplicate entrepreneurship. See it? Opportunity recognition is a skill. Capturing it is a skill. That's the triple threat. If you can raise money and tell that story and do those two things, that's the triple threat entrepreneur. That's alpha, in my opinion. That's the alpha entrepreneur. That is what I look for when I meet people. And I say, wow, you got all the right stuff. See an opportunity, you know how to capture it. By the way, capturing is not easy. It's a zigzag. It's not a linear path. And then tell them the stories about just getting champions, customers, investors. That's this holy grail. And look what OpenAI did. They did the same thing. And then people left OpenAI to start Anthropic and other I think that's good analysis, John. I think you're right. You get to that product market fit. And then, and then the game becomes very similar, right? Even though you're using tools differently. I mean, if you're a huge company now, like all these big tech companies, 
they they got to have, you know, I, I know this for a fact, they got internal people saying, all right, how do we drive AI to the company so that we can have less employees? I mean, that's really what they're doing. <laughs> they, they don't say that publicly, but some of them do actually, but that's what they're doing. I mean, why wouldn't you? And we got so much fat at these companies and drop it right to the bottom line. And so you're so, right. We should get Rebecca Knight, you know, to, to come on and talk about this because she's so, a real pro at this. So a couple of things I want to share with you on Y Combinator and the, um, Sam Altman and OpenAI. So first of all, um, at the, um, at the, at the Y Combinator, um, batch, uh, the, the, the 2024, uh, kickoff of their batch, they call them batches. Sam Altman suggested to YC founders build with the mindset that chat GPT five and AGI will be achieved, quote, relatively soon. And most GP4 limitations will get partially slash entirely fixed in GPT-5, according to one of the founders uh, there. Um, there. So pay, pay attention, okay? GPT-5 should be a big fix for all that stuff. Now, that being said, so let that sit for a minute. We'll come back to the <laughs> my point here. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's being reported today in Bloomberg that um, the COO of OpenAI, Brad Lightcap, is reporting that the, the G, chat GPT enterprise has reportedly gained traction with the enterprise with 260 businesses signing up for the service within four months of the launch. Okay, that's that's huge. Remember, remember they launched their, the, the enterprise version? So now you have enterprise version. They launched the store on Wednesday. OK, so custom versions of the chatbots coming out and it's being reported that on, on Twitter and others that the larger models and Fitzgerald reported this on his blog, that there's people coming out doing analysis saying that good prompting of the bigger models is better than the specialized models. Yeah, the, the cube AI is probably not, a, they're, they're probably not as good as the cube AI on certain prompts, but because we have better data. But that brings up an interesting question, Dave. If OpenAI can continue to move the needle on innovation, they can, it's a matter of pace. Can they keep the pace between them and the second place person, of, um, the well, same gap? Can they keep it? Is, I mean, back when we did this, the, the breaking analysis, January, 2023, and we sort of, I was spitballing and saying, hey, this is sort of controversial. Let's take a, you know, Sarbjeet and I took a, a a contrarian approach saying they won't be able to maintain their first mover advantage. You, of course, said you thought they would. I remember after that, George Gilbert pinged me and he's like, Dave, I, I think you're wrong. And he's like, I agree with John. They got to have, they're going to be collecting the most data, the best data, and they're just going to be better at this stuff than anybody else. Yeah. And that so far seems to be proving true. I mean, their launch before they fired Sam Altman on the, that open AI launch day was, uh, I thought, amazing. And I think I'm I'm excited about the store. A lot of people are like poo-pooing it, but I, I I really am impressed. And I think they that, could, you know, they can our 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 AI could fold into them. I mean, we don't know. We have to play it by ear. You know, we got to look at that and again. Yeah, a lot going on, Dave. And it's it's an exciting time. 2024 is kicking off. Um, we're going to be at the cube. We're going to be all over the place. We're going to be doing a, a New York visit. I'm probably going to pop to New York to do some cube there. Um, just got the phone today with um, executives at SAS, Red Hat, uh, Lenovo, and IBM around doing something in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. Um, we're going to experiment with taking the cube on the road. Uh, you'll see us out there. We've got Mobile World Congress happening on the 26th in Barcelona. SuperCloud 6 is coming up on the 13th of February. So mark your calendars. Uh, if you're interested in speaking and doing a panel, let us know. We've got the super panels coming out as well. Um, the focus again is on you know, it's really data, data and AI. Um, so, uh, SuperCloud Two was kind of data focused. This is this is going to be more data and AI focused. So, if Nvidia, you're interested, let us know. We got Nvidia conference coming up in March. Uh, the CNCF uh, KubeCon in Paris, um, and then just just a lot going on in the Q1. So pay attention to the Q. We got tons of analysis. You're going to see a lot more news coming out of our studios in Palo Alto and. Massachusetts, where Dave's at. That's uh, our kind of big super pops, points of presence with the Cube. And again, our on location, you've seen a lot more of a Cube live everywhere uh, at events, as we always do. And uh, again, siliconangle.com. We had a great uptick in traffic this month, Dave. So the audience is growing. And then on the LinkedIn network effect is good. 2024 is going to be the year of community. I think we're going to see a lot of community, Dave. Uh, we've had great community engagement this past year. 
the Cube Collective is a, a vote of confidence that our audience is going to lean in and contribute with us. Shout out to the folks participating in, in the Cube Collective. Um, you'll see more ex experts and executives, right? And executives uh, that are retired, they're like analysts now, Dave. Because Bob Picciano wants to meet in Boston on, on the uh, in February. Um, get him on the Cube Collective. He's a genius. Um, just a lot of great stuff in, happening. So get, you know, give us feedback on the Cube Pod. Um, let us know what you think guests you'd like to see on the cube, what you want to see us cover. Um, a lot of events coming up again, another big year for the cube. Uh, Kate with us. You'll see some new hosts as well. And, uh, we'll see you next time. Dave, thanks for thanks, John. good Friday and enjoy the weekend, everyone.